نضمن لكم النجاح والتفوق بإذن الله My dear students, let me welcome you all to a new edition of physics. In this edition, we'll learn about the atomic structure. We'll learn about Bohr's atom. Also, we'll study the spectrometer, its mode of work, the use of the device. So let's get started. Atomic spectra. Bohr's model. We'll start with uh, Bohr's atom. What about the postulation of this? First of all, at the center of the atom, there is a positively charged nucleus. So at the center, there is a positively charged nucleus. Okay. Negatively charged electrons revolve around the nucleus in orbits. We call it energy levels. So we've got negatively charged electrons that rotate around the nucleus. Each orbit has a definite energy value. Electrons revolving around the nucleus can only occupy certain set of allowable orbits. So they can only, yes, occupy certain set of allowable orbits. The atom is electrically neutral. The question is why? Why the atom is neutral? simply because the number of electrons which are negatively charged, electrons around the nucleus, equals the number of electrons, equals the number of positive charges in the nucleus, number of protons. An electron does not radiate. This is very important. An electron does not radiate energy when it is in one of the Yes, allowed orbits. But the question is, when will the electron radiate energy? Okay. This statement was contrary to Maxwell's theory. But Bohr, yes, evaded the conflict with this theory by just stating that Maxwell's theory does, does not apply to systems of atomic size. Okay. Thus, he postulated that an electron could revolve in any of the permitted orbits indefinitely without radiating energy. To radiate a photon, an electron should make transition from higher energy level, denoted by E2, to a lower energy level. So the electron radiates energy when it relaxes from higher energy level to a lower energy level. In this case, a discrete amount of energy is released. Discrete amount of energy is released in the form of a photon. Energy of the photon, yes, depends on frequency of the photon. And it is equal to h nu. h is a constant known as Planck's constant, new is the frequency, and it is equal to the difference between E2 minus E1. It should be equal to the difference according to the conservation of energy. Okay. As I said, new is the frequency of the emitted photon, and H is Planck's constant. The Electric forces, column forces, and mechanical forces, Newton's forces, are at work in the atom. We can apply 
Yes, these forces. This is very important. We can estimate the radius of the orbit by taking into consideration that the wave accompanying the motion of an electron should form a standing wave. Okay? A standing wave is only formed when the circumference of the orbit is equal to a whole number multiple of the wavelength. Let me say it again. A standing wave is only formed when the circumference of the orbit is equal to a whole number multiple of the, yes, wavelength. So circumference is 2 pi r is equal to n lambda, where n could be, yes, 1, 2, 3, yes, it is an integer. The circumference of the innermost orbit is equal, yes, one wavelength of the electron wave. Once again, circumference of the innermost orbit is equal, yes, to one wavelength of the electron wave. The second orbit has a circumference of two wavelengths. The third orbit has a circumference of three wavelengths, and so on. And now talking about line spectrum of hydrogen. It is line spectrum, talking about the spectrum of hydrogen atoms. When hydrogen atoms are given energy, they absorb different amounts of energy. Then they then make transition to higher energy levels. So when hydrogen atoms are given energy, they take this energy and make transition to higher energy levels. Electrons remain in the excited levels for a very short time, short period of time, called lifetime. Usually it is, yes, 10 to the power of negative 8 seconds. They then fall to their ground state. When an electron makes transition from a higher energy level, denoted by E2, for example, to a lower energy one, denoted by N1, it emits a photon having energy, as I said, it is equal to the difference between the two energy levels, E2 minus E1, which is equal to H nu. The ground state has the lowest energy. Since electrons in different hydrogen atoms, your attention please, electrons in different hydrogen atoms absorb different amounts of energy, they radiate different amounts of energy. That's to say the emitted photons will have different frequencies. We can say they'll have different, yes, wavelengths. The color of the light scene is a, yes, color of the light scene is a composite of all the different frequencies. And now talking about series for hydrogen atom. We'll take it one by one. Layman series. Okay. They are produced when electrons, yes, move in, move from higher energy levels to level K. When electrons makes, yes, transition from higher energy level to Yes, energy level K, when they relax from higher to K. Okay, so this is the first series. We call it Layman's series. What about the frequency of the light produced, or frequencies? This series lies in the ultraviolet region. 
short wavelengths and high frequencies. So we cannot see these wavelengths with the naked eye. Second series is Balmer's, and this is visible one. Okay. In this series, electrons move from higher energy levels, yes, from higher energy levels to level L, where N is equal to, yes, 2. And what about the frequencies and wavelengths? As I said, this series lies in the visible region. And we've got a series known as Pushing series. In this series, electrons move from higher energy level states to level M, where N is equal to 3. So in this case, electron relaxes to M, where N is equal to 3. And wavelengths, yes, this series lies in the infrared region. And we've got bracket series. And it is produced when electrons move from higher energy levels to level N, where small n is equal to 4. Okay. And also the wavelengths, yes, lie in the infrared region. And the last series is found series. And they are produced when electrons move from higher energy levels to energy level O, where n small n is equal to 5. And also, they lie in the far infrared region. They've got the, yes, longest wavelengths. Yes. And now, talking about the spectrometer. What about the spectrometer? It is an optical instrument which is mainly used to study the light emerging from different sources. So it is a device used for studying the light emerging from, yes, sources. It analyzes light into visible and invisible components. It analyzes light into visible and invisible components components. And now talking about the structure of the device. Okay, we've got three major components. They are shown in front of you. We've got yes, something called collimator and it is to produce parallel rays of light. Then we've got a prism to disperse the light and we've got, yes, a telescope. We'll take it one by one. Okay, still talking about the structure of the device. It consists of, yes, collimator. What about the collimator? The collimator consists of a tube. The tube has two ends. Okay, so it consists of a tube with a rectangular slit of variable width at one end and a converging convex lens at the other end. Okay. The slit is located at the principal focus of the converging lens so that the light rays which emerge from the lens are parallel. Okay. Note the function of the collimator is to produce parallel light rays. This was the first component of the spectrometer, the device used for analysis light. Collimator and it is to produce parallel light rays. We've got a turntable prism table on which a prism is placed, the prism is set in the position of minimum deviation. So the prism disperses the light coming from the 
Yes, thank you very much. Coming from the collimator, yes, the prism disperses this light into its components, separating it into whatever colors are contained in the original beam of light. And finally, we've got a telescope adjusted such that the parallel rays entering it are brought to a focus near the eyepiece. And now talking about mode of work. How does it work? How it works? The light from the source is focused on the slit of the collimator by a lens L. Okay, by a converging lens. The slit is placed at the focus of lens L1. The parallel light emerging from the collimator falls on the prism which is set in the position of minimum deviation. So it disperses the light in its components. The telescope is directed to receive the light emerging from the prism. The objective L2 of the telescope focuses the rays of the same color. So once again, we focus the light we want to examine on the, yes, one end of the collimator. The slit of the collimator is situated at, yes, the principal focal length of the converging lens. So we've got parallel rays, which fall on a prism set in the position of minimum deviation. What is the function of the what is the function of this prism? Yes, it disperses light and analyzes it into its components. And finally we've got a telescope to converge the same color. We've got very important hands here when the spectrometers are made for special purposes. They are called spectroscopes. And instead of saying spectrometers, we call, yes, spectroscopes. A spectroscope is an instrument for viewing a spectrum. Also, in the previous instrument, spectrometer, if the light is dispersed, the light dispersed by the prism is directed to follow on a photographic plate Yes, the device, the instrument is called a spectrograph. So a spectrograph is a device for photographing a spectrum. The usual method for obtaining a pure spectrum is by using, so now we want to obtain a pure spectrum, by using, first of all, a narrow slit at the principal focus of a converging lens, to produce parallel rays, okay? So we need something to, yes, produce parallel rays. This is the function of the collimator, okay? We want also a prism set at minimum deviation. And we want a converging lens to focus the rays emerging from the prism of the same color. Okay, the slit of the collimator should be narrow and placed at the principal focus of the converging lens of the collimator to produce parallel rays. The parallel rays emerging from the collimator should fall on a prism set in the position of minimum deviation to disperse them into visible spectrum. Then, the light dispersed by the prism is directed to fall on a convex lens to focus the rays of the same color. And now we've got some questions, give reason for. Yes, first give reason, the slit of the 
collimator should be narrow to obtain pure spectrum from the spectrometer. Why the width of the slit should be very small so as to obtain, yes, pure spectrum? Okay, what is the relation between the width of the slit and pure spectrum? Okay, a wide slit is equivalent, can be excellent. A wide slit is equivalent to, it can be considered as, a number of parallel slits. And since each such parallel slit produces its own spectrum, the result is overlapping of colors. So if we use a wide slit, the result is overlapping of colors. Another give reason, in the spectrometer, the rays incident on the prism should be parallel. Let me say it again. In the spectrometer, the rays incident on the prism should be parallel. If the incident rays are not parallel, the different rays of the same color would deviate by different amounts. If the incident rays are not parallel, the different rays of the same color would deviate by different amounts. This would cause overlapping also of colors. Another give reason, in the spectrometer, the prism should be set in the position of minimum deviation to obtain pure spectrum. Why the prism should be set in the yes, position of minimum deviation? In the minimum deviation position, the rays of the same color passing through the prism will emerge out okay, from it from the prism in the form of, yes, a beam of parallel rays. That is to say, in the minimum deviation position, the different rays of the same colors falling on the prism are deviated by the same amount. Hence, all rays of the same color get focused at the same place by the converging lens of the telescope. And now talking about types of spectra. Okay. We've got two types of spectra. Visible spectra. Okay. And this spectra includes absorption spectra. We call them dark line spectra and emission spectra. Okay, and there are two types under the emission spectrum. Bright line spectrum and continuous spectrum. As I said, we've got two types of spectra, visible, of course, and invisible spectra. Okay, we'll be able to study, yes, bright line spectrum and continuous spectrum under emission spectra and dark line spectra or absorption spectra. We'll take them one by one. Okay. By the way, invisible spectra, yes, includes ultraviolet and infrared. We'll start with emission spectra. Emission spectra are produced when electrons fall from higher energy levels to, yes, lower levels. So photons are emitted. Photons having different frequencies and wavelengths. Once again, emission spectra are produced when electrons fall from higher energy levels to lower ones. In this case, we call electrons relax from higher energy levels to lower energy levels. We'll start with continuous spectrum, and it is the spectrum of the solid object. Okay, what about it? 
It is the spectrum, definition of continuous spectrum. It is the spectrum which contains wide range of frequencies. In a continuous spectrum, the colors gradually change from one color to the next. So, we've got, yes, wide range of frequencies. And the colors changes from one color to the next gradually. Examples. It is the spectrum given out by a glowing hot solid. For example, incandescent filament of a lamp. And now talking about bright line spectrum. What about it? It is the spectrum which consists of a number of colored narrow bright lines. So, it is the spectrum which consists of a narrow colored, okay, consists of a number of colored narrow bright lines. With wavelengths characteristic of the element which emits light against a dark background. So, light spectrum is characteristic, yes, of the element emitting the light. Bright line spectrum is given out by a glowing gas. Yes, so I want to remind you of something. Continuous spectrum, yes, is given out by a glowing solid or molten liquid. Okay, but to obtain bright line spectrum, we need to have a gas or vapor. A bright line spectrum is given out by a glowing gas. Each gas has its own bright line spectrum. Flame tests for certain solids are examples of bright line spectrum. Flame tests, okay, the tests you perform in chemistry are examples of bright line spectrum. Okay, and we want you to know something. The solid in the flame vaporizes. So, I still want you to know something. It is the spectrum of a gas or vapor. Bright line spectra are the fingerprints of the atom. They are characteristic of the element emitting them. And now talking about absorption spectrum. Let's de define this spectrum. It is the spectrum which consists of dark lines. It consists of dark lines indicating the absence of certain wavelengths and frequencies. Indicating the absence of wavelengths of light against bright colored background of continuous spectrum. Absorption spectrum is produced when a gas or vaporized element is exposed to a continuous spectrum, white light for example. And we'll give you examples for absorption spectrum. Fraunhofer dark lines, and these are very important, Fraunhofer dark lines, which appear in the solar spectrum. In this way, we've come to the end of this edition. Until we meet again, my best wishes to you all. Thank you very much.